I want to share with you a story explaining what motivates me to work as a psychiatrist and researcher in the area of novel treatments for depression. Catherine is a 36-year-old single mother with three young children. She was referred to the Black Dog Institute Clinic with severe depression and suicidal thinking. When her psychiatrist phoned me, there was desperation in his voice as he was running out of treatment options for Catherine. When I first met Catherine, she was moving slowly and she struggled to gather her thoughts. She had few facial expressions and had lost the light in her eyes. She told me about all of the failed trials of antidepressant medications and other treatments. I could really feel her struggle. Her children missed their mum as she went back and forth in and out of hospital. I assess Catherine is suitable for the ketamine program. A long-used anaesthetic, there was a growing body of trial evidence for ketamine in depression where other treatments had failed. The team objectively measured Catherine's depression scores at the start of treatment and with every ketamine session. Now, I want you to imagine Catherine begins at the foot of a giant mountain. That's where her depression score was, rock bottom, way down in the severe range. And after just a few treatments, she began to climb that mountain. Soon she reached the halfway point and started to feel some real relief. And the glimpse of a smile crept in. Now, given how unwell she had been, I thought, well, maybe this is as good as it gets. However, she kept on with her ascent, and after treatment seven, Catherine reached the summit. Or, to use medical jargon, she went into remission, no longer meeting criteria for clinical depression. At the two-month follow-up, she remained on top of the world, still in remission while continuing on an oral antidepressant. Catherine told me that she had got her life back. She used the term resilience. She could take care of her kids. She could do things like go to the supermarket. And importantly, suicidal thoughts had markedly reduced. This is an example of a novel treatment changing Catherine's life. Depression is a common mental illness. Globally, more than 264 million people have depression. It affects more women than men. And among you here today, one in seven will experience depression in your lifetime, and one in 16 are currently affected by depression. Depression can vary in different people, from more mild forms, where lifestyle changes and psychological help can make a big difference, through to more severe biological forms, where, like Catherine, someone can't get out of bed in the morning, they are slowed down mentally and physically, and they may be suicidal. At this severe end of the spectrum, medications, going into hospital, and treatments like electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, can be life-saving. The research team I'm a part of is interested in this more severe end, which includes treatment-resistant depression. This is the one in three patients who, like Catherine, have failed to respond to multiple trials of antidepressants and psychological therapies. So what can we do for patients with treatment-resistant depression? I've shared with you a success story involving ketamine an anaesthetic also used recreationally because of its mind-altering properties. But when we use it in a controlled medical setting, we have found it safe and effective for depression. In fact, last year, a ketamine drug was approved in Australia for depression by the TGA. You have no doubt heard about the renaissance of interest in psychedelics as possible treatments for mental health conditions. LSD, MDMA, ayahuasca, psilocybin. Psychedelic research here in Australia has only recently started up. And I've been curious as to whether psychedelics have potential, like ketamine, to tackle treatment-resistant depression. One psychedelic which is showing promise is psilocybin, the active ingredient in so-called magic mushrooms. Now, use of psilocybin is not new. Prehistoric rock murals 
in places like Spain and Algeria suggest that psilocybin mushrooms have been used for thousands of years, with indigenous tribes consuming them in spiritual ceremonies. So why would we want to give psilocybin to a patient with severe depression? Well, we know that in clinical depression, there is reduced connectivity in the brain, and that brain cells or neurons actually atrophy. Animal studies show that psychedelics like psilocybin stimulate the growth of neurons, increase the number of connections between them, and overall promote neuroplasticity, potentially reversing the effects of depression. Now, in humans given psychedelics, they report to us subjective things like changes in colors and sounds, mystical experiences, a greater sense of meaning in life increased empathy and connectedness with others, and a deeply felt positive mood. These effects likely result from stimulating the neurotransmitter serotonin, as well as changing the brain's activity at rest. When we look at brain activity with psilocybin treatment in healthy individuals, what we see is an increase in different brain regions talking to each other. Functional MRI shows that the whole brain seems to light up. Now, you might think that this medicine is simply stimulating brain networks. But in fact, psilocybin actually quietens default mode network activity in the brain. Default mode network activity is what the brain is doing when we are not focusing on anything in particular, the opposite of when we are paying attention. And by quietening resting activity, this allows other brain networks to communicate. Now, while the science is not yet certain, our best guess is that in those with depression, the default mode network locks individuals into rigid, negative ways of thinking about themselves, the world, and the future. And by temporarily reducing default mode network activity, this allows greater whole brain connectivity. And for depressed patients trapped in repetitive cycles of thinking, feeling, and behaving, a reset. And formation of new brain connections, which may assist with depression recovery. Two main studies to date have looked at psilocybin for depression, with promising results, though these studies haven't been done in treatment resistant depression. And we already have very effective therapies for mild depression. It's those with treatment resistant depression who are in need of new therapies, and this is where the research gap lies. You may be curious about how psilocybin treatment works in practice. So let's go back to Catherine and imagine that she didn't respond to ketamine. Would we give her a magic mushroom and send her to the forest to have a psychedelic experience? For a start, psilocybin is a Schedule IX illegal drug in Australia, and it cannot be prescribed in a clinical setting by a doctor. However, special government permits can be sought. To administer the drug as a part of a clinical trial approved by a research ethics committee, with trials seeking to evaluate safety and if psilocybin could be an effective treatment for depression. As part of entry into a clinical trial, Catherine would undergo a full medical and psychiatric assessment to determine her suitability. For example, excluding a personal or family history of psychosis would be important, where giving her psilocybin. Could cause harm. For safety purposes, she would not be given actual mushrooms, but instead 100% pure psilocybin made in a lab. Now to the process itself. There would be two therapists present, for example, me and a co therapist, who would work with Catherine. Preparing her mindset would be important. Psychedelics act as amplifiers, and negative headspace before treatment would be magnified, and vice versa. That's why, in the days before the treatment session, we would build rapport and ensure Catherine felt safe and secure about the process. The setting also impacts the outcome. And that's why we have carefully designed our therapy rooms. And while they are located in a hospital, they do not look like hospital rooms. Imagine Catherine enters a quiet and tranquil room where she sits on a cozy and comfortable couch with warm lighting and contemplative artwork. She would be given a psilocybin capsule, 
with careful monitoring of her physical and mental states and full medical backup. The whole psychedelic experience taking over eight hours. In the days following, we would work with Catherine to understand the insights she has gained during the small number of psilocybin treatments, helping her to integrate them into lasting changes. So what happens to the next patient I see in my clinic, like Catherine? They are running out of treatment options and perhaps don't respond to ketamine. Could psilocybin combined with psychotherapy be a new magic treatment that resets their default mode network and allows new brain connections to form? There is great hope from patients and clinicians that psilocybin might provide an answer. But before psilocybin can be considered a therapy for treatment-resistant depression, we first need to undertake carefully designed research trials with my team embarking on one such study. How we answer the questions of safety and if psilocybin works for treatment-resistant depression is not a matter of magic, but of science. <laughs>